It's not easy to grow a professional services firm from a small team to a large company. But in this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, Brian Saunders, founder and CEO of Big Time Software, is going to talk about doing just that. Let's jump right in. All right, now I'm excited to welcome on our guest for today. Brian Saunders is the founder and CEO of Big Time Software. Brian, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thanks for having me, Anthony. I'm excited to be uh, be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Uh, obviously, being that uh, Big Time is focused on, you know, an online time and billing solutions is such an sure. important aspect of what we do, especially in the civil engineering space. You know, I know. I know civil engineers don't like filling out their timesheet, but it's really the bread and butter and how you can build your clients. So um, it is, and, yeah, and right, right, right. Really important. So, so Brian, before we kind of get into some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, take us back a little bit and tell us how you, you know, how and why you started big time. You know, I, I actually grew up as a software engineer. You know, I, we, uh, I ran a company in, in uh, what, what people today would call product consulting before product existed back in the nineties. And, and so we would go in and consult with firms and, you know, grew kind of through that same space that we try to help today. You know, we started out with two or three guys, me and a couple of founders and, and in, you know, my living room and, and eventually kind of grew that to one of the top 25 software firms in Chicago and, and, you know, had a, a great exit in just, you know, just before the market crash in 2000. And, and, and so, you know, I kind of lived that problem and my old partner used to say, you know, we learned every lesson that we learned through just brute experience. You know, we learned all of the stuff about time management and, and utilization and how to get projects to work well, not just work well, but work well together all through just, you know, failures and, and fixes and figuring out like how to run the company better. So by the time we'd been through that whole boxing match, big time was real, a real passion for mine because at, at the time there wasn't really anything out there to manage a professional organization effectively. And, uh, you know, there's lots of one-off solutions, but we needed something that, that wasn't out there designed for plumbers and electricians and forest rangers. We need something that was designed for professionals. And so that's kind of where I spent, you know, the next decade and a half kind of building the system that is today the core of big time. That's great. And, you know, obviously engineering firms are interesting in terms of the way they grow and the they way really they, are the way they evolve. And, you know, you've had so much experience kind of watching them. Maybe you could talk kind of a little bit about the, the evolution of engineering firms from kind of infancy to how they kind of scale. Yeah, you bet. And you know, everybody's different. So I, I hate to, to paint too broad a brush with the industry because every uh, uh, engineering is especially, it's like accounting where it's very much, um, you know, there's a kind of a, a prescription for how those organizations grow. Engineering firms are ultimately an art, you know, and so so they develop a specialty and that might be a very lucrative specialty with five or six people over the course of the entire you know lifetime of the firm. Or it may be we start out just like big time did with with two or three people who are focused on hiring younger engineers and trying to kind of train them in our methodology and take advantage of the area that we have an expertise in. So it's always a little bit different. And, you know, increasingly, we're seeing a lot of people come to big time after the firm has been grown by one generation and really try to uh, convert it from this lifestyle business into something that can grow to 40 or 50 engineers, you know, as the, as the next generation takes over. So it can take a lot of different paths. But ultimately, uh, there's this point in a, in a young engineering firm's life where uh, the founder or the initial partners can be involved in the sale and in the in the scoping of a project but they're not really involved in the delivery of every project and that it's a super uh, stressful period of time and you know that happened with us too i remember the moment at you know for us it was probably 10 to 15 people where uh, you know, I kind of realized, boy, that a lot of these projects that I'm in, you know, I, I made commitments to personally, I'm not the one delivering on those commitments. And it, so it gets super stressful. And, and it, you know, the way you uh, approach that stress, typically, it depends on your personality. But for me, it was very much like being in everybody's face, you know, so where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? And kind of moving people aside and getting involved. And, and it wasn't helpful for the growth of the organization. Uh, and so that's where a system like Big Time comes into play, and really any system comes into play that allows you to say, look, here's the system, here's the budget, here's the commitment, and I want to push that down to the rest of the organization, and then I want to react where I can be helpful, and I want to let the team work where I can't be helpful. 
And that, that uh, period of time, that evolution is typically where uh, somebody calls us. And, and that's where we kind of get started. And then there's this, so let's so call it the first phase from uh, an individual business into something where we're working as a group. Right. And then as soon as you get used to that period, that working as a group, you get to, you know, 20, 30, 50 uh, individuals. And now suddenly, well, not suddenly, but typically the, the impetus for the next hire is, is a financial team or a business team. Somebody who, uh, whose job is to work on the business as opposed to work on the client projects. Uh, and that individual brings, you know, expertise in terms of workflow. They're typically head of operations. Maybe, you know, they're, they're might have a finance bent, maybe they're a controller, but their, their job is to really systematize the things that you do every day. And oftentimes that's another flex point where they start to leverage systems like big time to, to measure things like utilization and realization and to try and do allocation planning and figure out who's efficient and who's not and try and systematize things. And that's, the exciting part about that uh, moment, that flex moment in a, in a firm's growth is that you, you really see kind of a hockey stick after that individual has their, uh, it kind of puts their thumbprint onto the organization. Both very, very highly stressful of those transitions. Yeah, for sure. And, and kind of the reason that I was asking that and digging in on that a little bit is because I know for a fact a lot of our listeners are, you know, civil engineers aspiring to own their own firms in the future. Sure. So I think it's really good for them to understand, you know, what that progression might look like because it is stressful and, you know, they should be prepared for that. But at the same time, like you said, when you get and through it, it, you, it can the problem is you get advice from well-meaning advice from people who are at different stages of an organization's growth. And from their perspective, they have this aha moment and they want to share it with you as a one or a two person firm. Hey, this is really important or that is really important. And the reality is, you know, the advice that's helpful is helpful because it's, you're at that stage in the company's growth. So when somebody says you really need somebody to manage the, you know, work on the business of the business, well, wait a sec, no, we're three people. We need somebody who can help us turn this from uh, occasional, you know, uh, uh, jobs into something that's systematic. We need to develop our kind of secret sauce, if you will. So it, it, it's, it's super, it's super tough, but I, it, there's never been a better time to go out and start your own firm. So. Yeah, you know. for sure. And that's great advice, right? Really, really seeking, you know, advice and mentorship from someone who's kind of close to have where you've been, you know, not too far off, or at least they can, you know, put themselves in those shoes in a relative time. Um, so just digging a little deeper on that, I know you have something that you call, you, know, you talk about growing your firm beyond the two pizza team. Can you, yeah. you maybe talk about that a little bit, what that, what that means? Yeah, you bet. The, 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 it's funny that that's a, that's a, uh, uh, an Amazon thing, um, you know, the idea that all these great things are invented by teams that you can feed with two pizzas, right? And so, so, uh, at, and that's that first stage of growth, right? Like I might be an individual or I might be two or three people, but we can literally sit together in a room and work through most of our challenges uh, uh, together, right? And, and these days maybe sit on a Zoom screen where every face fits onto that expanded view, right? right? Like we get it, we're all there. We, like I know everybody, I know every project. That's a great feeling. And, it, and, it, and it's a feeling that lots of engineers, especially engineers, and that's not just civil engineers, but anybody in that with that bent, you know, that engineering bent loves because it's enough social uh, that I can really collaborate and grow as a professional, but it's not so much um, drudgery that, I, that <clears throat> I, I'm disconnected from the client work, right? And so uh, then as the company gets bigger than that, you, you, lose, you lose insight into what that team is doing. And so the question is, how deep can you step into it so that you can feel comfortable that you're delivering what you committed to to the clients, uh, but you're not standing in the way of the people who are benefiting from that two piece of team. Back, back to your point about finding mentors that fit your stage, right? Like you're, ultimately, as you get bigger, your job is to help the people in those teams get better at what they do. That's your whole job. Right. And so one, I got to figure out what it is, what our secret sauce is as a firm so that I can go out and make sure that I can reproduce it. But also how am I, I'm shifting from the business of delivering client work to the business of helping those people deliver client work. And that shift is, is mentally massive. It's, it's really tough and you have to work on how am I going to communicate this thing, whatever it is. And every engineering firm is different. It might be a geography. It might be a municipality. It might be a specific kind of, 
uh, uh, type of projects that you're very good at, at scoping out. So how am I going to help these new engineers understand and kind of own that secret sauce and deliver it to my clients in a way that we're all proud of? Yeah, that's great. And I like terms like the two pizza team, just because it's helpful for you to think about, oh, I'm still in that stage where, you know, I got to feed everyone with two pizzas, just, you know, because sometimes you're stuck in it. So you can't see how you're progressing and what stage you're at and, and things like that are helpful. And, And really at EMI, we're going through that now. I mean, I used to do all of our instructing and all of our podcast hosting and now we have a handful of instructors and now we have several different hosts on the different podcasts and so you know you're right it's a stressful time you want to make sure that the quality of the services that are being delivered are maintained but at the same time you also have to step back and realize that if i keep doing this all myself we're not we're never going to hit that trajectory or that path 100 and anthony the the question you find a podcast that just quite isn't, isn't quite what you're looking for and you have an opportunity to now talk to that interviewer or that individual or that reporter and, and help them understand, all right, well, here's why it's a miss. Uh, stepping in, that's, you're, you've already made the mistake. You know what I mean? Like you've already, you've already, the miss already occurred in that you didn't communicate yet enough for that person to be able to competently execute. So it's less a question of kind of browbeating the interviewer, right? Like why is, why is it missing this and this and this? And more a question of, okay, so, so we know these are important. I want to confirm that we know they're important. And now how can I make sure that I'm communicating that to the next person so that I, don't, I, I never have to step in? And it, it's, it's the key differential between that kind of two person team size and the 15, 20, 30 person firm. Those latter firms have made the transition successfully to say, we can identify what's a success and we can identify what it takes to help other people build that success. And now it's just a question of how good are we at scaling up? How good are we at training? And and it takes some time. It takes some calendar time to get good at that. Right. And and really, I always tell people for engineers specifically, this is one of the hardest things to do because if you think about it, when you start your career, you're knee deep in every detail of every project and you like it, right? Because that's what you taught and learned in school. You like doing those calculations, but if you really want to be that kind of entrepreneurial engineer who's going to start and grow a business, you're just going to have to pull yourself out of those details and find someone that can handle them. And like Brian said, not get sucked back into them and, you know, kind of, kind of resist that. And, and it is a difficult thing to do, but it's good to, you know, to talk about it a little bit with you because I think people need to hear about it. So it's fine. I talked to, uh, I talked to somebody who's running a software firm much bigger than us. And he's a, he's a mentor in Chicago for, for me and for a bunch of other people. And I was sitting in his office about, about, he's a product guy. He's like me. And I said, uh, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, don't you miss it? Like, don't you, like, aren't you tempted to go sit at your desk and think product and call the person who's running it now and say, Hey, what about these seven things? And it's like, I'm looking at the firm to come over and chat with you. And I, and I'm thinking of four things I do with your product. And he said, well, the company's the product now. And so, and I thought, you know, so I, I have the same approach, but now it's the company's the product. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And it's kind of the same thing with engineering, right? It, it, less so the, the firm, right? It's not the logo, the website, the case studies, the, the marketing team, the finance, right? Although those are indicators, but it's more like, how are we communicating what makes us unique such that when I hear questions from young engineers, I know that the that I know I can spot from the questions what the problem is. So the calculation you're doing is on, okay, well, we ended up here and I wanted them over here. So, so let's work backwards and figure out the calculation of how they got there so that we don't do it again. It's less the answer to the specific question and more the answer to how do we get here. Right. It yeah. And be fun in its own right. The philosophy is you know, really important, right? Like you said, the product is the company, just that little, that little mindset itself is, is really huge. And, and so all that being said, let's talk for a minute about your kind of journey from going from software engineering to obviously becoming a CEO of a company. For you, was that something that was kind of a goal of yours? Like talk about that. Cause I know, like I said, a lot of listeners want to do that. Maybe some listeners don't have any idea they're going to own their own company, but they may end up doing it. So tell us about kind of your specific journey. Well, it's funny. I, I've always been an entrepreneur. So I, so I, I worked for other people when I was in college, but but, you know, I, I've kind of always been um, uh, kind of doing my own thing. And it, so, and it, so it's hard for me to say what the transition is. I know, you know, I, we work with two or 3,000, you know, CEOs at, at firms big and small. And so I get to talk to them a lot, too. Uh, and, you know, I think there is, um, you know, there, you kind of make fun. There are two types of individuals, right? There are people who 
who are entrepreneurs and people who could have done that, right? And so, so okay. as you start your, your firm, you hear a lot from the latter, right? As, you, as you're off doing your own thing, you, you hear a lot from people who, oh yeah, I was gonna start my own firm. And so I, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's a, there's a kind of hobbyist entrepreneur who just, who, it, it takes a lot of risk. It takes a lot of stupidity to be able to just jump out and say, you know, I'm gonna forego the paycheck. Right. But on the other side of it, um, it's super rewarding. And, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, the only person you have to blame is yourself for both your successes and your failures. And, and the, the, you know, part of the joy of growing the company is that you get to experience that and share it with other people. So, so you increase the number of people that can celebrate those successes and, and come together for all the failures. Right. And so, so, and there will be a ton of those. So, so, sure. so so you knew you knew you were going to be in a, yeah. you, know, you knew you were going to grow a business. It was just a matter of finding, you know, what industry, what type of business. Yeah. And it's, what's, what's fun about that is that, you, you know, you, uh, I think that the side of the things that stop the person who ought to be running their own business and you know who you are, right? You should be on your own. What stops you? And one of the things that stops you is this spreadsheet paralysis. Uh, you know, you, you, you go do the analysis and say, okay, well, so I know I could probably get two customers or two clients and I think they could produce this t level of, of revenue, but I don't think I could get, make the same kind of money and I, I don't know how I would do X and Y. So, so as you put together the spreadsheet, you, you can't get the numbers to foot. And um, especially in services, it's so... Uh, you know, it kind of works itself out. Like as long as you're, you, you continue to practice your craft and you're good at what you do, as long as you can find people who believe in you as an individual who will give you a chance, uh, you can grow a pretty successful engineering, uh, engineering practice. And now the hard part is where do you want to be? Do you want to be 50 people? Do you want to be five? Do you want to have a specialty in a given geography or a given type of, you know, structure site, uh, uh, you know, uh, end product? And, and be the best in the world at that. And that's it. Uh, and, and the nice thing is today's business environment lets you to pick any of those things. But you do kind of want to have an eye toward what you're trying to build because then all your decisions are going to drive you in that direction. That's great. And, you know, one thing I'll add to that just from my own experience, and, and I agree with Brian in that, you know, that kind of uh, paralysis by analysis, I think haunts a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, taking that step, getting out there, you know, they say they want to have their own business, but they never actually take that step. Maybe they try some things on the side. And for me, what I recognize is that once you kind of go all in on something, it's a total different game. Like you're yeah. so into it and you have so much energy and it's, it's kind of, you need to go all in. It's easier than you think, but I mean, it's not easy. Don't get me wrong. But when you're doing all those calculations and saying, geez, how am I going to get two clients? If you're working on this every day, all day, like, and you need to get two clients or you're not going to get paid and you know, be able to pay your mortgage, you're going to get two clients. So, right. but sometimes you just need all that pressure. You need to just go for it and put everything into it. And so, you know, I'm just sharing that in case some of you are out there saying, you know, I'm really close, but, but uh, it's like, well, unless you try it, you're not going to know how it is to be full in. Right. And, and think about the clarity you get once you are fully plugged in, right? Like it, right. That it, it's scary at first. And, and I, uh, I'm not sure there ever, ever is a right time to make the move, but it's always just a little bit later than you should have, you know, like, right. like it, nope, that's, I, I could think more and more and more. It's never quite the right time. And then when you're in it, you're like, God, I should have done this last year, or I should have done this last week, or I should, you know, you just, you develop that energy and that clarity. And suddenly those opportunities just show up. I can tell you without question that when we were doing product consulting back in the nineties, I have no idea how we, how we landed our first client. I can tell you who they are, you know, but I have no idea how we landed them. They just kind of happened. And, I, and we didn't have a plan for it. It wasn't in the spreadsheet. It wasn't the clients that we identified as likely. They just kind of happened. And I think that that's the type of thing you get when you just jump in you know, with both feet. Yeah, no, that's great. So Brian, just getting a little bit to you know, the recent times now, we had this pandemic that we've sure. been going through, still going through. And that's kind of, you know, that's caused hardships, of course, across all industries. And I know you work with professional services firms. A lot of them are engineering firms. And I know Big Time's done some surveying of their, their clients and in, in the industry. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what you found with some of that surveying in terms of, you know, now and maybe, you know, in the future based on what you're hearing of kind of where we're headed. If you could share any, any insights that you may have picked up. 
Yeah, you bet. You know, we um, to set the, the stage, and I'm sure we can share those links with your with your viewers somewhere in the in the podcast once you publish it. But um, w- you know, we went out with to our several thousand customers early on in in kind of uh, mid March to ask them, you know, are you reducing staff? How long do you think work from home is going to function? How are you dealing with travel? You know, just some basics. And then we followed up with them in May, and we'll do our third kind of survey in June just to get a feel for sentiment and how it's changed. Um, we're a few, when by we, I mean engineering, we're, we're maybe a, a ridgeline or two away from the epicenter of this particular recession. You know, you may be consulting with people who are in, uh, you know, travel leisure restaurant, but you're not in that business, right? So, so while those businesses are imploding and it's all over the news, engineering isn't necessarily imploding. When we looked at the survey, I'm staring at the results above, so I keep staring up at the next screen. Uh, we had something like 41% say in, in this most recent survey that they have little or no impact for, for revenues in 2020. Um, and even among those folks, we only had about 23% that the impact, say the impact would be significant. And that, that's principally related to the types of, of firms that you, or the types of customers that you service. It's also, you know, I think a, a reflection of how strong the pipeline was at the end of 2019. A lot of the work that you're doing today, because the recession is so quick and so deep, and then the, in theory, the recovery should be, you know, if, if you know, whether it's V-shape or not, it should be fairly quick because those, those businesses that shuttered can suddenly open, right? And so, uh, so that does create a little bit of a bounce. Um, and it could be that, that people are seeing uh, uh, less of an impact in 2020 revenue because 19 is carrying us through. But most firms only have four to five months worth of visibility in their pipeline. So as it stretches, as we get, uh, you know, state closures or, or reopenings that take longer than that, I'm kind of burning through that three or four months or four to five months of, of visibility, meaning booked work that I can continue to work on because, you know, I don't need to, to do anything new. And, and, you know, it takes longer, obviously, than that to, to really get back to somewhere close to normal. Uh, then, then it, it will probably start to fe- see the sentiment change. But for now, we haven't seen a lot of it. A uh, significant number of our customers that are small are looking at PPP in order to preserve staff. A uh, very small uh, group of people are looking to, to lay off significant staff, although more than half are looking to cut back in some way. And I had a, I don't know if we talked about this already, but uh, Anthony, but I had a conversation probably a month, month, six weeks ago with a, an engineering firm in California who, who said, you know, he just had, had furloughed his whole, his whole survey team. And I said, I don't get it. Like what, why it's survey. Like, why are you guys, they, they can go out and survey. They're out in the middle of nowhere. Like they're not going to see anybody. Why would you have to furlough them? And he said, I can't pull permits. Like the state of California has said, none of the work we do is essential. So we can't pull permits. So, so there is that type of thing that incur- is encouraging to me because uh, that means as soon as that guy can pull permits, he's got backlog. He can go out there and get the work done. Right. Uh, a lot of people, though, so the, the, I think that what's interesting, you asked about 12 months from now, like what happens next? And I do think that there's a fundamental shift in, the, in our physical environment that will never go back to the way it was. And, and, uh, and partially because um, people don't want to be shut up in offices, partially because we've had months and months of people working from home where they've been effective. Uh, and so maybe I don't need to go back to it. And partially because... I want to be prepared as a company for the next threat. And so I don't see a lot of expertise in the new physical space. I don't know what that looks like, but, you know, post 9-11, which was the crisis that was where my industry was at the epicenter, right? That's when technology went to zero. And, and, and uh, post 9-11, we had another change in physical infrastructure. Like our public spaces changed. And at first they were all these, concrete blocks in front of the federal building downtown Chicago, right? They're just really ugly. And slowly, architecture and engineering firms started to specialize in, in an area that is a brand new area, which is, okay, so how do I protect this public space but not make it look like a bunker? And that's an expertise that people now make a ton of money on. I think that there's that same opportunity in this space today, but I haven't seen it play out yet. It'll be interesting to see who steps to the fore. And, you know, to your point, it's pretty much exactly what we're seeing, you know, in talking with a lot of civil engineering companies over the past few months. I mean, I have to say, I think every one of them told us that Q1 2020 was their best quarter, kind of like in the history of their company. Sure. Right. But then to your point, 
while they have some backlog now, what they're concerned about, of course, is, you know, all infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure funding comes from people driving their cars and paying tolls. Yeah. And that hasn't been happening. So that's going to catch up eventually, unless, of course, the federal government does some kind of infrastructure stimulus, which is possible. But that's where uncertainty, I think, is playing in a little bit is, yeah, everything's going great. We're riding some stuff now that we've had, but just not sure. We can't kind of see over that hill and see what's going to happen when some of this stuff catches up. So, um, so again, we're talking with Brian Saunders, CEO of Big Time Software. And, you know, we're talking, we've talked a lot about building engineering companies, building companies in general, but Brian's talked to a lot of engineering CEOs, his clients. And I know a lot of you out there are either growing a civil engineering company or you want to start one. And so hopefully some of what we've talked about has been helpful. What we're going to do now is just take a quick break. We're going to come back in our civil engineering hot seat segment and wrap it up by kind of peppering uh, Brian with a few more questions here. So stick with us. I hope you are enjoying this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, which is produced by the Engineering Management Institute. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for more podcast episodes and for all of our Engineering Manager 8020 Shorts videos that we publish weekly where we interview successful engineering managers. Now it's time to jump into our Civil Engineering Hot Seat segment. All right, we are back with Brian Saunders, CEO of Big Time Software. Big Time is an online time and billing solution that helps service professionals. And Brian, some great stuff that we've been talking about so far, but now we want to focus a little bit more on on you and kind of yeah. some of your routines just because, you know, that's what we do in the civil engineering hot seat segment. Right. So the first question is, are there any specific rituals that you practice every day? For example, do you have a specific routine, whether it's morning, lunchtime, something that you do consistently on a daily basis? Probably. That helps you I, I have no idea. You know, it's funny. I, I, uh, I think I like the, um, the chaos. I mean, you know, part of, part of uh, being an entrepreneur is that you wake up to a new opportunity fire, uh, you know, right. uh, you know, important topic, whatever. And I, you know, I guess, um, I do like to leap into it. You know, uh, I don't really do much in terms of breakfast. Um, so you your know, routine I, is consistent chaos, basically. It is, it is consistent chaos. You know, I, I, my wife makes fun of me because I'll come home and, and really hungry and she'll say, well, what, what the heck? Like, what did you have for lunch? And I, I, I don't think I ate lunch. I don't remember. I was at my desk the whole day. So, so I think that once you get into it, I, I really like that chaos and it just kind of sucks me in and keeps me occupied for the full 10 hours. And then, um, you know, I feel like that kind of energizes me for the next day. So you should, I guess routine is important for sure. Getting into the details important for sure. I would say, try and get into the stuff that you love right away. Like whatever it is, like get into the stuff that you're passionate about because it gives you so much energy and that's going to drive you through the rest of the day. As the company grows and there are those things that you don't enjoy, get them off your desk. Like somebody somewhere is going to really love that. If, if, if your thing is not the financials or the, the monthly billing and, and the, the whole workflow for invoicing, there is somebody who's passionate about that. Give them a chance. Like that's the way the firm grows. You focus on what you love. You find other people who focus on what they love and together you build a great company. That's great. All right. Next question. I see you have a lot of books there. What's one book oh, that God. has been a big, big time, you know, help for you personally or professionally, um, you know, we read a lot of books, but there's always those couple that stick out. Is there any that stand out for you? Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of what I do is in, in kind of the software product space. So I, I, you know, read a lot of Jeffrey Moore. He's kind of an archetype for me. You know, my philosophy for product is kind of a marriage between Jeffrey Moore and, and the innovator's dilemma that Clay Christensen wrote back in the nineties. And so, so those two are kind of fundamental uh, touchstones for me. I do a lot of incidental reading. Most of this is um, not at all related to business or self-help or, or, uh, you know, anything related to the product that, you know, that book Sapiens is great. If you haven't read it yet, you should. It's about the kind of the history of humans from a, from a park, you know, archaeologist perspective. And uh, so I would pick that up and read it tomorrow. Um, but I, you know, I think probably if I read you four titles off that shelf, you'd be like, yeah, I got nothing. There's nothing that links those. Well, you just out. gave us three books. So that's, <laughs> right, that's okay. a good start. That's a good start. Okay. Whew. Um. All right. Next one. Thinking back, you know, and I know you've been an entrepreneur for pretty much your whole life, but in any okay. situations where you did have managers that you can remember, oh, okay. um, what, what 
made them, you know, what did you like about them? Or if you think back and say, man, that was a great manager to me. They were a great manager. They knew how to lead. Like, what are the characteristics that anyone that's led for you? I don't know about the the great managers in my life um, because they're more personalities or or, uh, just this cult of strong personality. But I, um, but I think the guys who are most successful that I have uh, talked with the, the people who are most successful at building firms that, that I get to talk with their, their number one trait is empathy. Like they, as a manager, uh, the first thing I think is, all right, well, how did you get here? And how must you, where, where are you right now? And then I can, I can use that empathy to figure out how to get you to where you ought to be. Right. So, um, you know, there are people who talk a lot about kind of hard driving managers, you know, pound on the desk and, right. and, and that type of thing. And I just, I know that there's a place for them. I just, I am not motivated by them at all. The, the people who really help me and the people where I've seen make a profound difference in, in the folks that work for us, they're empathetic and they, they listen first, think about it. Oftentimes, you know, I might present a conflict or a problem with a client or a situation and their answer to that is, okay. I get it. I understand. I got to think about it. I'm not sure. Like, I, I, and that think about that. So, that, so now you have empathy, and then coupled with that, you have just this total honesty about about what they do. We we have uh, at the at, in the software. One of the things people either love or hate is that it's very open. You know, we try to we try to make sure that the budgets are open to everybody. The the billing rates are kind of you know out there for 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 people to understand in terms of how it affects the budget, uh, and. And I just, you know, I think that reflects my own personal philosophy that the more open you are with the line employee, the, the staff at the firm, the more likely are they are to do the right thing, because ultimately that's kind of what they want to do. And so I think empathy and honesty are the two things that really kind of drive a successful manager in my, in my life. That's great. All right. Last question here. And we call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question, but really it could be focused on any uh, service professionals. Cause I know that's who you work with on a, on a broad basis. I thought you were going to quiz me about some calculation. No, no, no. <laughs> but if you get an elevator with, you know, a young service professional and they're like, yeah. you know, I really want to grow my career. I want to be a CEO at some point, And you only had about 30 seconds with him or her. What would you tell them? I see it a lot. I, I, my son is 19 now and thinking about business and they ask the same question, him and all his friends, what do you, what would you do? And I, I think uh, you're at a firm now where you can get close to somebody who is doing what you do. So, so, and typically in a civil engineering firm, that means the partner uh, it, partners that you work on and other firms, it might be somebody who's kind of a senior architect um, or engineer, get close to them, you know, understand kind of not just how they do the work, right? Because it, you know, your job is to do the work. You ought to know how to, how to, run the calculations and, and put together the, the, uh, the right specs. But uh, how do you deal with a client? How do you deal with this problem? And it, 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 like, listen to it. And then the second piece of advice that's important, if I had more than 30 seconds, we're in Chicago, it's a very tall building. Uh, it, it get close to the client. Like, like every single chance you have to sit in a meeting with a client, be there. I don't care if you can't say a word. If it's not your client, you have no idea this is a brand new project that you're sitting in. For some, sit in every client call, meeting, conversation you can possibly sit in. Because what you're going to see is, oh, okay, all of us take this for granted, but they have no idea. Like all of us understand that soil composition is super important or whatever the thing is, they have no idea. And, and when, 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 when Joe or Sally explained it to them, they didn't get it. And it, you start to understand the myths. And so a lot of selling is storytelling. And the more you're involved in, in customer relationship, the, the better you're going to have, the more stories you'll have to tell. That's great. And I love that last piece of advice there. I mean, that's what I did as a, as a young civil engineer, you know, oftentimes, you know, we have to go to planning board meetings and present to the towns and the civil engineer is there with the client. And, you know, when you're young, you don't go to those meetings. They don't have a budget to bring you to those meetings, but I just would go. I just told the engineers, yeah. go, you know, volunteer no. what it's one night a month. And you're going to see the client interacting with your boss. You're going to see your boss presenting the project. And, you know, you can't, that that's just invaluable. I mean, you can't get that back. And that's something that you can really use going forward. So, so with all that, again, we, we appreciate the time and, um, Ryan Saunders, founder and CEO of Big Time Software. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today on the Civil Engineering Podcast. It's nice to see you again, Anthony. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast on YouTube. 
produced by the Engineering Management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.